Hey guys, it's Brian here. Our new Facebook group is thriving and we'd love to have you. Just search for the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show and join the community. It's a judgment-free zone for all things Grand Canyon where you have access to me and just about every guest we've ever had on the show. It's a place for information and inspiration and to get your canyon fix. That's the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show Facebook group. We hope to see you there. Now on to the show. Like, we were both like, are you good? Like, what's going on? He's like, oh, no, I just lost my footing. No big deal. And we were like, listen, if you're having trouble and, like, rethinking this, it's not a big deal. We can turn around. Greg and I, at that point, could turn around, go up, go up with you and head back down. It's not a big deal. And he's like, no, 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 I need to get to the bottom. I need to get to the bottom. I, I Like, I just need to get to the bottom. Hey, everybody, I'm Brian Special, and this is the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show presented by Bright Angel Outfitters. Just 15 days before the interview you're about to hear, Greg and Jessica Ryan had the most traumatic experience of their lives, and it happened at the Grand Canyon. In just a three-week stretch, from June 16th to July 7th, four hikers died below the rim, and Jessica's uncle, Scott Sims, was one of them. It was a family trip. Greg, Jessica, a friend, Jessica's dad, and his brother, Scott, 69 years old, from Austin. Three of the group, Greg, Jessica, and Uncle Scott, were to hike down South Kaibab, spend two nights at Phantom Ranch, and then head out on Bright Angel. The timing of the trip, the end of June, one of the hottest and most dangerous times of the year at the Grand Canyon, but the only time they could secure reservations at Phantom. Their hike was scheduled for Saturday, June 29th, and the high temperature at Phantom that day would top out at a sizzling 110 degrees. But that's in the shade. In the direct sun the trio would be under, it can be far worse. Even though the high on the rim that day was 89, the canyon can get up to 5 degrees warmer every 1,000 feet you descend, which is why temperatures can be more than 20 degrees warmer at the bottom than they are at the top. But Scott was no rookie. He'd been below the rim at least five times. He loved the canyon. Jessica remembers from her childhood postcards on the refrigerator from her dad and Uncle Scott sent by Mule from Phantom Ranch. Now, here they were. And down they went. What you're about to hear is the entire conversation I had with Greg and Jessica on July 14th, just two weeks and a day removed from their own personal nightmare. It's clear the wounds are still fresh, and the emotions, from sadness to bewilderment to anger, still very raw. And it's clear they almost needed to talk. So that's what we're going to let them do. With no editorializing and no judgment, just let them tell their story, which they wanted to do on this show, even turning down national requests from the likes of Inside Edition, because they want others to learn from their experience. So here now, in their words, uncut with the exception of a couple of interruptions from their dogs, is the story of Greg and Jessica Ryan and their uncle, Scott Sims, on the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show presented by Bright Angel Outfitters. My uncle Scott was a professional basketball player when he, in like the 70s, he was super heavily involved in tennis and uh, basketball. He went to Missouri State, or not Missouri State, he went to Mizzou. But, University um, of Missouri, yeah. Yeah, and he played tennis and basketball there. Um, he was super active. He, everybody, I mean, he was like just like good time uncle. He wasn't, he, he was divorced, no kids. So he was kind of that like fun uncle that was there, for, always there for a good time. Um, I wasn't super close with him, but like only because he lived in Texas and we lived in Pennsylvania for my entire life. Um, but you know, holidays, birthdays, everything. We always used to see each other. It was my, uh, he was my dad's brother and my dad was six years younger than Scott. He lived in Texas and outside of Austin and Georgetown. And he, he owned a skincare company there um he was super involved with my grandparents who both passed away last year which was why we were going to the grand canyon to spread their ashes at the grand canyon 
Um, my dad was there. My, uh, my husband was there. We had a friend there and my uncle was going, but my grandparents wanted to be at the Grand Canyon for their like last wish. Um, so we had this trip planned, obviously, because most of the time for Phantom Ranch, you have to have a reservation far, far out. Um, so we've had this trip, we've had this trip planned for like over a year, a really, really long time. My dad and my uncle had done this like trip like five times and that's, they would talk about it so much. Um, we had posters on, posters on the fridge from the Phantom Ranch from my dad and my uncle from like 1995 when my brother were, and I were really, really little, um, you know, writing on the back with, uh, we can't wait till you guys come here. We can't wait to do this trip together one day. Um, but my dad. So they actually and, sent you guys postcards by, by mule from the bottom of the yeah, Grand Canyon. Yeah. So we had those on the fridge cause we were so excited to go. And I mean, they, they talked about this trip so much and how many people went on this trip, how hard it was, how hard the hike was and the people that went down with them that had such a hard time. At one point, one person had to get helicoptered out, um, so it was like, they let us on, like it was very, very serious. Meanwhile, we didn't really know what to expect cause we didn't do a ton. I didn't do a ton of research on the hike. Um, but I was kind of going with what my uncle had said, but our background, um, for Greg and I, I'm a tennis instructor and CrossFit coach and have a lot in the health and nutrition world. And my husband who's also here, but my husband, he is, works in logistics, but he's also a CrossFit coach. So we're like very, very into health and nutrition. And to be honest with you, we were wildly over prepared for this hike. We do a lot of hikes with the dogs and we're trying to hit like every national park. Um, but we didn't, we didn't know exactly what to expect. And I didn't do my research, which didn't really matter by the end of it. But I, we were kind of just going off what he said and what he knew. And we were more worried about him since he is 69. And I know that he maybe wasn't in the best shape he's been in. Um, but he like was telling us, he's like, this is the best shape I've been in in the last 15 years. You know, this has really motivated me to like take care of my health. Um, I don't know what he had been doing. He said he'd been walking a lot, but however, Austin doesn't have, I mean, if you've been to Texas, it's very flat. Um, it's very, very flat. And he said he had been doing some weight training and stuff like that. I don't know exactly what he had been doing. Um, but he was walking like 10 miles again, very flat. Um, but he knew what he was getting himself into because this yes. is not his first time below the room. No, this, he had been down there five times in his lifetime, given the last time was like 20 years ago, but still he had done this five times. So we were more going off of what he knew and what to expect from him. And we weren't really worried about us um, just because we do hike. We have, The Appalachian Trail is really close to us. So we hike that all the time. Um, or like when we go to like national parks and stuff like that, we're like all over the place, never resting or anything. Um, and obviously our fitness level is really, really good. But so tell him, us again, tell us, so tell us again what the, what the overall goal of this, why, why was this hike planned so far in advance? I mean, this was a, a year you guys were all talking about this and ultimately yeah. it was you three who were going to go below the rim and, and do the hike, but there were more of you up there, correct? Yeah, there were more of us up there. There were actually supposed to be more people going to the bottom, uh, but they all like pulled out and they were like, actually, that's crazy. I'm not ready for that. I don't want to do that. My dad and his friends stayed at the top. Um, mostly because my dad knew that he was in no shape to be doing this hike and his friend as well. Um, and you know, kind of everybody kind of like told my uncle, they were like, are you sure you're ready for this? Like, are you, are you positive you're ready for this? And he was like, everybody keeps telling me I can't do this. You know, I, I'm, I, I don't know if it turned into like a proving people wrong type of thing or what had happened exactly. Um, but it was planned so far out because they always used, my grandmother was a school teacher. So she always had summers off. So they always used to go to the Canyon at this time, like 4th of July ish with her. Um, why they picked this time. I guess that's the reason why I'm not even sure. Um, I believe it was the first available that they could get for the, uh, the lottery for Phantom Ranch. I think that was the first available that they had. That would make sense. Yeah. 
So it was uh, circumstance that that yeah. drove you to uh, to July. Yeah. I mean, that happens. Yep. That happens. That happens so often. Have hey, you guys ever been to the canyon before? Either one of you? I, I, I have been not. there like yeah, momentarily around the rim. Okay. I was driving cross country, so it wasn't. Gotcha. One of those Clark Griswold. Hey, look at that, honey. And then yeah, yeah that's yeah, exactly gotcha. what it was. Greg, what did you think about this going into this? Because you guys are obviously in incredible physical shape, mm-hmm. uh, but there's obviously so much more to it with the canyon that unless you've done a lot of research, uh, you may not be aware of, especially when it comes to the to the heat in the canyon. How prepared did you feel everyone was? And were you guys aware of the heat that you were going to run into on that day? Yeah, so I, I did a ton of research. I did way more research than Jessica did. And it's just, you know, I have more access to the internet and stuff like that during my day. Um, so I was able to look up, you know, kind of war stories on the internet just to see everybody's experience with it. Um, so Jessica and myself were very ready. Like she said, you know, we were hiking as much as we could. We were doing as much as we could, you know, hydrating. We're very much so in the fitness world. So we were great um, and excited and uh you know we could only go by what scott was telling us that he was ready he was ready to go and he'd been training and all that stuff so yeah we were we were more than ecstatic to get started and you know kind of took it as it came i imagine he had to be just so i'm just trying to put myself in his shoes yeah 69 year old guy single guy in in austin here he's got this family trip to this place that he loves so much and that means so much to him and that he's been into five times and here he is taking uh his niece and her husband down and showing them the canyon for the first time he just had to be over the moon excited about this trip oh yeah he was so excited yeah i mean we were we were sitting at dinner the night before at el tovar before we started and we were just like ecstatic and giddy to ready get like ready to get going first thing in the morning and And most people don't make it down there most people don't make it down there so we were like so excited to be like that one percent of people that make it down there and like hang out and it's so i mean once you get down there if you ever get to go i mean i know you've been but like for the people listening amazing incredible like just crazy um but i will say that alcohol did play a role in this whole situation um like the night before he was in vegas for a week before for a convention um for like the skincare and i don't know how much he had been drinking but i do know he was drinking a lot there and i'm sure he wasn't doing a lot um the week before in vegas physically vegas is anything, yeah. physically well vegas is like of one billion degrees so i mean even we were like there for a day and i was like this is horrible like my skin's just burning off my body um, but the night, even the night before he had like a few glasses of wine and we were like, I was like, maybe he knows something that I don't like, you know, like I, I, I can't, obviously I'm not going to be somebody that can tell someone to stop drinking. Um, especially like my uncle who's 69 and I'm not, um, but alcohol definitely played a role in this situation and dehydration. Mm-hmm. Um, we we woke up the next morning and we had breakfast at the El Tovar um, at 7.30. And now looking, like in retrospect, we should have left. We ha- we already should have left by then. Um, what was the plan? What, did, what was the plan? What time are you going to drop in? The, the plan was have breakfast, leave, and then leave. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't so- sure because I saw I was taking people like four hours. So we decided, we were like, okay, it'll probably take us a little longer. It'll probably take us like five. So if we get out of there by eight, get down there by one, we should be good. But I also literally am not, I don't understand what to expect on this trail. I have no idea. And like the heat doesn't really, I told you before, like it's been 95 in Pennsylvania with 100% humidity. So I wasn't too worried about the heat. Um and my uncle lives in Austin where it's like really, really hot. So I figured, you know, he, I guess he's fine. I don't know. But and you're going no- downhill. The- and yeah. we're going downhill. And we're going downhill. And we're going downhill. So, um, we have, we have breakfast and he doesn't eat any carbs, which already is like kind of a red flag, but I'm like, he knows his body. He knows his limitations. No big deal. Um, and I'm like, I said something about electrolytes to him 
And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, what do you mean? What do I mean? Like, you, did you, do you have any electrolytes? And he's like, no. So kind of also already lots of red flags happening. Um, we have tons on us. So I, I put some in his water bottle. We get to the top and there's tons. I'm sure, as you know, there's tons of people at the trailhead uh, because there's that ooh-ah point that people go to and then they head back up. And um, what time is this that you are finally we dropping? We left in? at 8.15. Yeah, we, we, got, we left the trailhead at 8.15. South Cabo um, Trailhead. Yeah, because I was taking pictures like crazy. So I have all these timestamps. I'm so excited like the grand canyon is the most amazing thing i've ever seen in my life it's beautiful every turn you hit and it's completely different than hiking on the east coast because hiking on the east coast you see nothing forever until you get to your summit whatever that is and then you start back down and it's nothing again so it's just a bunch of trees when you hike the grand canyon it's just beautiful the entire time like it's un it's unreal absolutely unreal so we start heading down there's a bunch of people he um he's telling us before that he tried to make his backpack as light as possible, this and that. And I'm like, I mean, that doesn't really, you need what you need, you know? Like, if you want to make it light, you can make it light, but that's fine. Um, and at the top of the Kaibab, I'm sure everyone knows there's, like, warning signs, hike at your own risk, there's no water, blah, blah, blah. Um, we start going down. We have... How big is a, the bladder in our backpack? So we each have a three liter bladder in our backpacks. Plus we have an additional 40 ounce like hydro flask. So we had probably close to 150 ounces of water each. And he like, we're walking down and there's a ton of people at that ooh point. So we're, we're going past tons of people and it's pretty much just stairs on the way down. And I'm like, just ecstatic like everywhere I look I'm like I can't believe I'm here I'm having the best time and we turn from that ooh point and we make the next turn and my uncle fell and it's it's like not did, easy did he even trip there. did he trip or was it did he trip or trip and fall or was it some some other reason so he said he lost his footing yeah and I, I was Can standing happen. behind him he didn't fall very hard like he just scraped his knee and that was that was it so we didn't really make that big of a deal about it so yeah i I was like oh i mean this is already hard like we're not even a mile in and this is this is pretty difficult um it's just stairs all the way down you really have to watch where you're putting your feet you can't really look up a lot um and he just like lost his footing and i was like all right no big deal and he's like oh my gosh i'm sweating a lot are you guys sweating and I was like, no, I'm not. And Greg was Greg was sweating a little bit, but he kind of, he sweats anyway. But, <laughs> but I'm not, like, I'm not sweating at all. So we go down a little tiny bit more and he takes kind of a worse fall that doesn't look great. His, his foot kind of goes back behind him. Mm. And I, if he didn't have really good flexibility, I something bad could have happened but i was like oh my god are you like we were both like are you good like what's going on he's like oh no i just lost my footing no big deal and he had one pole out but he had never used poles before and we were like listen if you're having trouble and like rethinking this it's not a big deal we can turn around greg and i at that point could turn around go up go up with you and head back down it's not a big deal and he's like no 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 i need to get to the bottom i need to get to the bottom i I, like i just need to get to the bottom and we were like all right man so we get this is only a mile in yeah Yeah. this is early um but I'm not, I'm still like in this like euphoric state of being in this amazing place. Like I'm like, just I, like, I can't stop looking around. I can't, I still can't believe I'm here. I can't believe we're here. This is like the best experience of my life. And we're walking down and we stop at the first like rest area ish. There's like Cedar a little, Ridge. yeah, I guess. And there's like a little like sheltery thing. Yeah. Um, with the, their mule ties there too. Mm-hmm. I think there so was we, some shade. Yeah, we stopped there, and he grabs a drink, and then he says something like, "I, I, I can't think. I don't know if it was then that he told us about his water situation." No, no, no. It was further down the trail. Okay, he's like, he's like, man, this was a lot harder than I remembered, and I was like, 
we're a mile in. Like, I don't, Cedar Ridge isn't very far and it's all downhill. So we keep, we keep walking. I think we pass, uh, we stop again and then the burrows are coming up. They pass us. We pass them. Oh no, before that, we passed another ranger. We passed a, we passed one ranger on the way down and he was under like a random tree. So there was, was definitely shade for that one part. And we passed him and we were like, Hey Scott, you know, this is, this is your chance. Like he's heading up. Like if you want to go up, go up with him type thing. And he was like, no, 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 no. I'm completely fine. Like everything's going to be good. And we, the only thing that we could do is trust him because he's done this before. He knows what to expect or he knew what to expect. And you know, we're just letting him go. And, if and, I, said, and I know exactly. I know exactly what you guys are talking about with the at Cedar Ridge. There, there's a. It's typically a preventive search and rescue volunteer ranger who sits off to the side yep. and yes. strongly, strongly encourages people because I, I've had it said to me, strongly encourages people not to go any farther because it's yes. so yep. hot. But you guys, yep. you have reservations at Phantom Ranch. Scott's got the experience. You guys are in great shape. Did you have any interaction with the with the Peace Hour Ranger? Did they did they encourage you not to go any further? Did they say anything to you? No. So I actually thought that he was going to say something, not to me, but to Scott, because he kind of already wasn't doing great. He was like, in, like, cause he was kind of in a full body sweat and I wasn't sweating at all. And like, like leg sweat and everything. And I was like, he doesn't like look great, but the ranger saw me and he was like, I guess he saw that I had like a bigger backpack on. And he's like, you're headed to the bottom. And I said, yep, we're headed to the bottom. And he was like, okay, have a great day. And I actually thought he, there was potential for him to stop us because Scott already was kind of struggling. Yeah. But I was like, maybe it gets easier from here. You know, like maybe it's not that difficult. It was. <laughs> and um, so we start, we start walking. We pass the burrows. I give him a protein bar um, to eat. And... It was and around we then. We gave him a salt packet too. Yeah. And it was around then that, so now he's had like two, we had element salt packets. So now he's had two um, salt packets and a protein bar. But it's around now where he's like, I think I, I don't think I brought enough water. Mm-hmm. And we were like, what do you mean you didn't bring enough water? And he's like, I only brought these two 20 ounce hydroflasks. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And at this point, I'm not even like in panic because I don't know what's up ahead of us. I'm like, no big deal. Like, I feel great. Greg feels great. You know, he's like not doing great, but like, I don't know what I had. No, he wasn't panicked. He wasn't scared. Nothing. So there were no like alarms going off for me. Looking back, I'm like, this was so bad. Like, so early. So bad. So early. Were you guys aware that there was no water availability anywhere on South Kaiba? Yeah, you yes. have the chance to yeah we were aware. We were so well aware. That's why you guys had you you two that's had we, uh, plenty yeah, of water. We were, but he didn't. Yeah, we were we were over not over prepared, but we were definitely prepared. We knowing. were over prepared for yeah. who we were. We are very over prepared. Um, so we went on. Is that called Skeleton Ridge? Skeleton Point. Mm-hmm. Skeleton that's Point. That's three miles down. Yeah. So we hit Skeleton Point. And because we we passed that last ranger and I'm like, this is kind of the point of no return, you know, and Scott's already saying he's like, I couldn't make it back up. He's like, there's no way I could make it up. And I was like, okay. So prior to us getting to Skeleton Point, he had fallen forward. That was when he fell forward. So he... Every single time he fell, he fell a bunch of times, but again, none of them were very... They weren't bad falls, okay? So every time that he did fall, we would aid him to help him get back up. Because he wasn't – he had poles on, so we would just, like, pick him up. You know, grab his arm, pick him up, whatever. The one time that he tried to get up on his own, he fell forward. Didn't hit his head or anything like that, but just got, you know, up, dirt on his face. You know, his, his poles were – getting him off balance and all that jazz and but he's like banged yeah, up and bleeding yeah. from the knee yeah he he had blood on both of his knees on his hands 
So then that point, from that point when he fell, I don't remember how far along it was, but it was before Skeleton Point. I would start walking behind him and like kind of guiding him in the right way and just trying to like, if he was to fall again, I would be able to help him instead of having him just fall, you know? So I was able to guide him and kind of balance him if we needed to. That had to and be incredibly getting, stressful. It was, you had yeah. no idea. So, But he's also like, I can't make it back up. There's no way I can get up there. We got to get to the bottom. We just got to get to the bottom. He's like, I'm not turning around. We're going to the bottom. And I'm like, all right. All like, right. I don't, I'm don't. i thinking it's going to get easier or something. But every time he sees steps, he's like, oh, my God, more steps. And I'm like, what the hell? We're going down. What do you mean more steps? Like, we got to go down somehow. Like, and, and the steps are difficult because they kind of are carved out from the mules. So it's more it is a deeper step. But he's also saying, like, are you guys sore? And I'm like, first off, no. Secondly, I've only been hiking for like two or three miles at this point, And I don't know how I would be sore in the middle of my hike that I just started. And he's like, I just don't think I prepared enough. And I was like, well, this is a bad time for that. This is a really bad time for that. He was complaining about his quads hurting and he wasn't able to move his legs well. And that's kind of when we started, you know, getting behind him and helping him as much as possible. Greg was saying that his back, he's leaning back in his backpack. Like, even though there was almost nothing in there, the weight of his backpack is pulling him back. And we hit Skeleton Bridge and I look down and I see all these switchbacks and I'm like, oh my God. Like, I was like, and we're completely fine, but it's starting to get later. He's taking a lot, he's taking breaks. It's getting hotter. And I look down and there's no shade. Again, not worried about Greg and I, but I'm worried about him because I recognize the signs of dehydration immediately. But again, I don't know the severity of the hike. I've heard that it's like super, super hard. But I'm thinking like, maybe it'll level out. Maybe it'll get easier. So we start going down uh, after Skeleton Ridge and it's just switchback after switchback. And he's probably stopping what every Often. couple switchbacks, every yeah. couple. Sw- Maybe I would, I would give him two switchbacks that he finished that he would just stop at the turn. And he's, and he's stopping and he's like, Oh, just, just, and you know, and when we, when we sit him down, and we don't have any service or anything at this point. As you know, the trail doesn't, there's no cell service. So when you, when he sits down, we have to assist him because he's like shaking. And if he was to sit down, he would just fall. So, and then he has the poles and he's acting more like the poles are crutches than they are poles. Yeah. And Greg's telling Yeah, him, so as like, you're, if you ever walk with poles, it's the same thing with skiing. There's supposed to be an aid. Right, they're not supposed to be crutches. So he was put he was putting himself in a horrible position because he was just relying so much on those poles that it was kind of throwing him off balance. It wasn't able to you know he wasn't able to catch himself because he was just relying way too much on the poles. And he's heel striking on every step too. So he's leaning back and he's heel striking. So he's almost falling backwards and Greg is literally catching him every single time. So now I'm starting to get nervous because I'm like, you know how the trail is. It's kind of like the trail and then nothing. Like there's, I mean, it's very easy to fall off. And I'm like, and I've started to panic because I'm like, they, he's going to take him down with him. Like he's going to, he's going to fall off. He's going to take my husband down with him. And then I'm alone. Like, <laughs> I was like, this is bad. So. And at this point, just so everyone's aware, at this point, you're going down the red and white switchbacks, which is the most difficult portion yeah. of South yes. Kaibab. Uh, and when you get to the bottom of the red and whites, again, totally exposed. There's nowhere to yes. hide. There's no shade. This is a day where temperatures reached 110 at Phantom Ranch at the yeah. bottom. Yeah. So it's brutally hot. And when you get to the bottom of the red and whites, after what you guys have already been through, you're only halfway to the river. Yep. Correct. Yep. I saw the sign. We're only halfway there. And I, yeah, it was and like I, the 3.8, 3.5 sign that's on the trail. And I, I was like, oh, my gosh, we're halfway there, guys. And my uncle, like, 
he's like, oh. And I was like, oh, what do you mean, oh? Like, you've done this a million times. Like, you've done this five times. What do you mean, oh? They even went back up one year that that way because Bright Angel was closed. So we're stopping a lot. He's done his water. He's drinking all of our water. And he goes to stand up. He, like, just by himself, he, like, falls forward again. He needs to sit down. He is like, I'm like, all right, sit down right here. And he's like, that rock's not flat enough. And I was like, we don't have an option. And I can't really pick rocks out for you to sit on. So you need to sit on this one. But he wanted a rock so that he could have his feet completely off the ground. And I sit him, I sit him there and he almost falls backwards off the rock. So Greg catches him again. So, after going down the switchbacks, when Greg's like catching him the whole entire time, for some reason I'm still not panicked. I don't, I don't know why. I'm just still not because I guess because this was the situation we were in, and I couldn't do anything else. And if Greg wasn't capable of what he is capable of, I have no idea what would have happened to us. Um, Greg is essentially carrying him at this point down that like straighter path towards um, the tip off. Tip off. Mm-hmm. So Greg's that entire straight way, Greg's essentially carrying him like he has his arms under his armpits. So every time he falls, he's catching him. But my uncle at this point is walking like a uh, paraplegic walking with crutches. Do you know how they're it's very hips forward and the, their legs kind of like don't have much feeling, but he's relying so much on his poles. It was it's a it's a nightmare. So. Every single step down, I'm holding the poles. Greg's assisting him to step down every single step down. And now I can see the tip off. I see it's way out there, but I see it. And I'm like, we got to get there. I don't know how far that is, but we have to get there. And I'm like trying to tell my uncle because he's like, I'm just so thirsty. I'm just so thirsty. And I'm like, okay, here's our water. Here's our water. Here's our water. And he's like taking breaks every like 50 feet or something by now but also i'm getting worried because it's getting really hot greg's getting really tired from carrying him and now i'm getting worried because it's what almost one o'clock yes yeah it was probably late late noon it's like probably almost one o'clock and we should already be down there and so i'm getting like I'm starting to get panicky. I kind of jog up a little bit to change my hat because now I have long sleeves and a hat on because I'm, it doesn't matter how much sunscreen I wear. I'm just getting scorched. And my uncle is like full body sweat. Greg's starting to struggle because he's carrying him like a full grown man. And Greg goes to grab the sunscreen. They catch up to me and Greg goes to grab the sunscreen out of my bag. And I snapped at him because now I'm in like panic mode. Cause I'm not sure what's going to happen and we're stopping every 50 feet and it is getting hot and there is no shade. We passed probably like two people, maybe a, pe- a couple of people passed us. And, but that was like really about it because it's a bad time of day and nobody's out. So after stopping every 50 feet and he's like barely moving, I start jogging down and I drop on, I don't know what the deal is with tip off, but I see it's a structure. So I dump my bag, I head back up and Greg's on one side of him. I'm on the other side and we carry him down and his legs are just like dragging. Mm-hmm. We finally get him into the tip off and I'm like, cause he's the whole time on the way down. He's like, I just need to get to the bottom. I just need to get to the bottom. And I'm like, what the hell you mean? You just need to get to the bottom. Like, we can't carry you to the bottom. Like, and he's like, I just need to get there. You know, I just, I just need a 15 minute rest. And I was like, I was like, dude, there's no 15 minute rest. that's going to help you. There's no rest. That's going to help you at this point. So we get in there, So you get to the tip off and there Uh is a shade structure at the tip off with benches inside Mm -hmm. um, that you guys can go and rest. So I assume you went in there. What, what happened after that? Because there's also an emergency phone at tip off. So there I'm wondering is. if you guys consider consider using it at that point. Uh, the tip off saved my life and my husband's life yeah, for, for sure. sure. Um, we got there, we lay him down, and I'm like, "We're done. We are done. We can't do this anymore." I'm, I know, like, 
I'm not going to die. He's not going to die. We can't carry you anymore. I'm starting, I'm like in full panic mode at this point. And he's like, well, I just need a rest. We'll see how it goes. And I was like, no, I said, no, because if we start going down, I said, I don't know what's next. I don't know what's next after this, but I'm looking, they have a map or is it a map in there? It's kind of like a guideline yeah, there's of where a, there's you are a map. on the trail. There's a map, but it also says the elevation that you still have to go down. And it says like 1,400 feet or something. It's and 1,400 I was like, feet in about two miles, two and a half miles or something like that. And I was like, no. I was like, immediately no. I said, this is insane. This is absolutely insane. We carried you to this point. This is crazy. We don't have water. Like, I was like, I have like five cliff bars and that's it. We had 40 ounces of water left between the yeah. two of us, or I'm sorry, between the three of us uh, to get down to the bottom and not knowing how difficult it was, how long it was. We only had 40 ounces of water at that point. And I knew it was Greg, only getting Greg, where was yeah. Greg, where was Scott's, what was Scott's mindset at this point? Because you'd been so, with him carrying him essentially ahead. the whole way. Was he, was he apologetic? Yeah. Was he no. embarrassed? No. Was he, no. was he, was he delirious? Was he of his mind no. at that point? Oh yeah. He was completely there. He was completely lucid, making jokes, you know, not apologizing. The only thing that he was apologizing for was how long it was taking. That was it. Cause at that point we got to the tip off at one thirty PM and we we're like planning on being done the hike in full by like 2 p.m. Because that would have given us six hours on the trail. Um, and 2 p.m. would have been the goal to finish by. We had just gotten to the tip off at 1.30. So, you know, the last the last two miles leading up to the tip off took two and a half hours. And like, I have it on my watch. Like, it's it's gnarly. But he's not he's not scared. He's not panicked. He's not worried. A couple of times, like, during, he's like, oh, I'm sorry to do this, like, early. He's like, I'm sorry to do this to you guys so early. And I was like, what? What do you mean so early? Like, so do this to us, period. Like, what? And then, like, at one point, he was like, oh, this is probably the slowest hike you've ever done. And I looked at him. I said, yeah, it is. Like, it was crazy. But at that point, I was still in, like, Grand Canyon euphoria that, like, I didn't even notice how bad our situation was and how serious it was so i lay him down and he's like i just need a 15 minute rest and i was like i'll give you a 15 minute rest and then i'm call. i'm using this phone i said because you're not he's because uh, he starts to like be like yeah even if i get down there i'm not going to be able to get back up and even if i get down there you know i'm going to be in such bad shape and i was like yeah you are like you are. And from being in the fitness world and seeing people dehydrated or have like rhabdomyolysis or have other severe muscle issues, I like, I know what I'm looking at. With that said, I know that like, I'm probably not, we're probably not the normal person hiking. And when I called the emergency phone, cause I was like, cause I was like, uncle Scott, we're done. We're done. You're getting helicoptered out of here. I literally don't care anything else. We are done. You call, When you pick up the emergency phone, also where the tip off is, the structure is there's a it's pretty big and there's a roof with like heavy duty chain link on the side. So there's a ton of breeze coming through. So even if it is like 100 degrees, it's actually pretty comfortable, to be honest with you. Yeah, it like, was a windy day. So it was it was definitely comfortable in the tip off. Oh, it was super comfortable. Yeah. Like it wasn't, you can cool it wasn't off. hot. Yeah. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't bad at all. And probably, I don't know how far away there's bat. There's a set of bathrooms. A couple hundred feet. Away. And but you did I, pick up the phone. I picked up the phone. It rings twice. And they're, you know, walking me through it. They're like, oh, well, how much water has he had? And I said, I'll humor you and tell you how much water he's had. But He's not getting any better. Like, we're not doing this. I can't carry him anymore. Like, and this isn't going to turn around. This is not a turnaround situation. My husband carried him for, oh, like, a mile and a half to two miles. Like, there's no way. So they're like, oh, maybe he needs some electrolytes. I said, I'll give him some electrolytes. But I'm telling you, his body's not working. Like, they said, well, what are his symptoms? I was like, probably severe dehydration and severe muscle fatigue. And I understand that they're kind of trained for, like, boy who cries wolf scenarios which 
I also am like people like tell me they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, this hurts so bad. And I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You know, but I'm like, this isn't a normal situation. Like, it's not like he's not he's not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. He's not making it to the bottom. Um, and at this point, he's completely I, the only emotion he's showing is like sadness of the realization that he's not going to get there. So he's laying on a bench. They send this, they send me to search and rescue and the search and rescue guys like, Hey, here are some options for you. There's a cache over by the bathrooms. I'm going to give you the code. You go over there. There's water in there. There's snacks in there. Um, there's like, a, there's a bunch of life survival things in there. And I said, okay. He said, call me back in a half hour. And I was like, you got it. So I go over there. I open the thing. There's water in there. There are some snacks in there. There's electrolytes in there. So I grab that stuff. I bring it over. And my uncle starts being worried about the cost of a helicopter. And as you probably know, the helicopter is free. But he starts getting worried about the cost of the helicopter. They're going to take him to a hospital. It's going to be so much money, this and that and the other thing. You know, the helicopter alone is going to be six to $7,000. And I was like, you don't have a wife. You don't have kids. What are you going to do with your money? Take it with you when you die. It doesn't matter. You're, you can't make it down to the bottom. We don't have any other options. Like, especially for today. I said, you're not going anywhere today. It's getting hotter and hotter. At this point, it's like two o'clock. And it's only getting warmer because it doesn't start to cool off for a few hours. So he's like, I just, you know, you guys should just go. And I was like, we're not going to go yet. So I call back the search and rescue guy. And he's like, I think they think I'm talking for him because he can't speak, but he's perfectly capable of speaking. So he starts talking to him on the phone um, about his, you know, symptoms or whatever. And he says to us, he's, our, my uncle says to us, he said, you know, they're going to try. Oh, because when I first start talking to them about getting a helicopter, they're like, I'm not sure if we can land there because it's getting windier and windier. But also the helicopters down the river doing a search and rescue mission down there. So we're not sure if we can get to him today. But if we can't get to him today, we can get, definitely get to him tomorrow. Perfect. He can't go anywhere anyway. And like he's in safety. The structure is perfectly safe. So he's like he gets off the phone. He's like. You guys need to head down. You guys need to go eat. Like, it's getting hotter. Like, and you guys won't be able to make it down if it's dark or whatever. And probably not, because after I turned that corner and saw the rest of the trail, I was like, oh, my God. Like, it's crazy. So we're like, okay, listen, this is the deal. We're going to head down to the bottom. We're going to eat food. As soon as it's morning, we head back up and we figure something out, whether you can make it down. Because they also had sleeping bags in the cache and um, like camping meals. So I grab the camping meal. I bring it to him. I grab the sleeping bag. I bring it to him. I grab more water. I bring it to him because at this point, I don't think he can even make it over there to the bathrooms in order to get there. And he's like, and well, worrying about him falling and everything. And like I'm that worried. Yeah. I'm worried about bathroom. him falling. So like, you know, Greg's like, listen, if we go down there, you promise us you can't leave because you're going to die. Like, you are in no shape to do anything. I said, the fact that we got you down here is a miracle. A miracle. So I'm like, listen, promise me you won't leave. And he's like, well, what if I get the helicopter and you guys don't know? I said, who cares? I said, then we can make it back up here in the morning and you're not here. It's not a big deal. I said, then we make it. Because we were supposed to stay at Phantom Ranch for two nights um, instead of one night. So we were like, then we go back down there and we hiked for the day and it's not a big deal. I said, but I can't have you down there because you're not going to be able to get back up anyway. Like there's, there's no way if you're struggling that much getting down and you have to be carried to the tip off getting down. I said, there's no way in hell that you're taking any trail back to the top. Cause I was like talking to them and I was like, can he take a mule up? Like, is there any possible way of like any of that? And they were like, we don't take mules up with people on the South Kaibab anymore because a mule fell off the trail a month ago. And I was like, Oh, well, that's definitely not an option then. And they were like, but there is a ranger station down there. So go talk to them when you get down there. So 
we head down and I'm, he's like, I'm not moving. I promise you I'm not moving. I can't move. And I was like, perfect. And I left him with all the stuff he needed, the sleeping bag, the water, the food. He had like a couple, like, uh, they, there was like one bag of, uh, cheese its in there. And I left him with like a cliff bar and a protein bar. Trail so, mix too. Yep. oh, and I left him with a whole bag of trail mix. Um, but that still had to be an incredibly difficult decision for you guys to split up. Oh, at oh yeah. Well, our, our decision was not, we weren't splitting up. Greg and I were not splitting up. And like one of us head down and one of us stay because we can't really, like if something happened to Greg on the way down, like I, 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 I like, and this was already such a traumatic experience. And I like, the only thing that made me feel better was when you pick up that red phone, it rings once and somebody picks up. So with my uncle and I was just, I, we were just making, trying to make the best decision for us at that point, because it was so stressful. Greg's exhausted. Like we don't have, like we have, there's water there, but like we don't have food. Like we don't have anything else. And I don't know what's after that. So, we make the decision that, you know, stay here for the night. If you get a helicopter out, great. If you don't, also great. We'll be up here in the morning. No big deal. Um, so we head down. Greg's a mess. He's in full panic. He's like, something bad's going to happen. And I'm like, what bad can happen? He can't move. We had to carry him there. Nothing bad is going to happen. And we get down there. We eat because we get – it takes us – Eight and a half hours? Uh, we left the trailhead at 8.15 in the morning. We got down to the bottom at 3.45. There's a picture of us taking it at Phantom Ranch at 3.45. So so it takes us that long to get to the bottom. Seven and a half hours, yeah. And I'm nervous because of all the energy output we had. And, you know, I'm just... Being I'm in like the sun the entire time. Yeah, I'm like... And Greg's in full panic because he's like, something bad's going to happen. And I'm like, nothing bad can happen. He has that phone there. He can call anyone. And so. What was telling you that something bad was going to happen, Greg? What was worrying oh, no, I, I'm, I just think the worst of every situation, really. Um, you know, I'm a, I, some people call me a hypochondriac. But, you know, I, I think the worst of every situation. And sure enough, like, my gut tells me something. And that's just the way that I feel. So That's we go to the, um, the, time. the ranger station down there and her name was Julia and she was amazing. And yeah. she said, I haven't heard anything about a hiker that needed help or a hiker in distress, but, uh, we have a ranger coming down for the weekend on the South Kaibab. I'm going to call him and let him know he's there, have him check on him. And then he's going to head back down. You can talk to him. Apparently this is like, not something out of the, the norm. Yeah. Yeah. Like not something out of the norm really, like where people can't make it and they just stay there or wait for help or whatever. Um, and she was like, are you guys okay? We're like, yeah, we're totally fine. You know, we're just worried about him. And she said that an hour after we left, Ben from search and rescue tr called that phone and no one answered up at the tip off. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's super interesting. Maybe he's sleeping because he was not like physically in good shape and he was very dehydrated because as you know, once you start and you're dehydrated, there's no going back. Like you're not going to magically get hydrated, especially, and if your muscles are in full fatigue, there's no, there's no recovery from that. And so she was like, um, the other, I'm sorry, what, what, was, what was the other ranger's name? Matt? Matt. Matt. Matt was on the way down. Also amazing. But they also told us that they put the tip off there because they used to call it the graveyard because people would get there and they would die. They, would, they were collecting bodies for years, apparently. That's what they told so the, us, at least. So the tip off has been there for like the last 10 years as a survival situation. Um, so we get, we get there, we come back. She's like, come back at 9 o'clock. He should be here. You can talk to him about it. And, you know, he'll see him on the way down and it's, it's no big deal. And I was like, she made me feel, she made me feel way better about it. Cause she like kind of made me like assured me that like, 
it was a safe place. People stay there, blah, blah, blah. So we go back at nine o'clock and I'm like knocking on the ranger door and no one's answering. No one's there. And no one's there. And I'm like, and I'm like, that's super weird. But there's also a red emergency phone there. So I pick up the emergency phone and I tell her who I am. And she said, oh, Matt knew you were going to be there. But there was a another uh, emergency that was unrelated that he had to get to. So he ran right by the tip off, but he didn't see anybody there. And I was like, OK, no big deal. She said, but he saw stuff there, but I, he didn't see anyone there. And I was like, OK, interesting, very very weird, but I still didn't, I still didn't feel bad about it because like the conversation we had with my uncle was uh, like very much like, if you leave here, you'll die. You can't leave here. Promise me you won't leave here. I promise. I promise. I promise. If you need anything, we'll come back up tonight. All you have to do is use this red phone. They'll get, somebody will get in touch with us, you know, whatever. So we go back to bed and the, the woman on uh, the red phone. It doesn't go right to search and rescue. It goes to something else. She's like, if you need anything, you can just come right back. We're here 24 hours a day. Just pick up the phone. I'll talk to you about it. We'll like, whatever. And it's like 11 o'clock. We're sleeping at Fan Ranch and we get a knock on the door and it's Matt and Julia. And they come in and they said, your uncle was Scott Sims. And I said, yes. And they said, he passed away. And I was like, I was not quite understanding at that point. And I was super confused because I was like, what do you mean he passed away? And they were like, he left the tip off on his own, started to hike down. And I don't even know how he got even close to as far as he got because we greg carried him the fact that he got because as soon as you leave the tip off it's just more switchbacks yeah it's, it's not any easier than no the entire hike was it's not any easier and the only thing i can think of is that he like was scooting down on his butt or something because there's no way he was walking i'm telling you right now there is no way he was walking where that's there's a sign that says phantom right and river trail left he went left instead of right and i remember walking by the river trail because the river trail kind of goes up and it's rocky and i was like that does not look like something i said it out loud i was like that does not look like something i want to do right now and they said that he went left and he walked down and he hit his head and there were some, somebody had, somebody had reported a delirious hiker and they said he walked down and he hit his head and he passed away on the river trail. And it was like out of body experience. I couldn't believe he left there alone. I couldn't believe he got so far. I trusted him to make the right decisions. I trusted him for us to do the right thing. Because the entire time down, he was putting us in so much danger. I was worried they were going to fall off the side. I was worried he was going to take Greg down with him. I was worried we weren't going to make it. I was worried we were going to, you know, we were in the sun too long. We were out of water. Like, the tip-off saved our life. And he just, be, between, I think, people telling him he couldn't do it and people and being worried about the helicopter expenses and just having so much of an ego that, like, if he does it, because the, all the whole time down, he was like, I just need to make it to the bottom. I just need to make it to the bottom. But he wasn't doing it alone, and we knew how extreme the situation was. But then at that point, when they had told us that, we were like, immediate guilt, immediately, what if this, what if that, what if we turned around before? But we, I mean, my, my dad was like, there's, no, there's nothing you could have done. There's nothing you could have done. He was going to do what he wanted to do the entire time. You couldn't have turned around. Um, at, he, my dad was like, he was in such bad shape from the beginning that he cho he made that decision. But at the same time, I'm like, what if we stay, like, if we stayed longer, was he going to convince us to take him down with us? Like, 
if you know what would have happened i just i don't know but i also am not even sure that he would have made the night there cuz he was in such bad shape at the tip off that i wasn't even sure if he was going to make the night you know make it through the night there and looking back at it now you know he wasn't panicked he wasn't scared he wasn't worried about anything and you know when i was talking to the rangers they were like there was nothing you could have done you guys got him to safety you did the best you could you know you came down you talked to us everyone knew about everything and he didn't call anyone he didn't call anyone there was it was just the most it's it's there's just so many questions that are not answered that will never be answered and for the people that found uh, there the ranger went down and he it took him he said it took him an hour to get there from the top to from the top to which is insanely fast insanely insanely fast um but again my uncle was older he definitely had some kind of alcohol problem going on he wasn't in as good a shape as he thought he was going to be i i don't know if he thought he was going to make it down there and like walk into dinner and be like hey guys i made it like it's insanity and Ins- like I, I, like he totally underestimated the entire hike the entire thing and it was so hot well, on our way down like so incredibly hot and like looking back i'm like was he even he was in such bad shape was he even going to make it through the night like should we have stayed up there with him and been there with him when he decided to pass away like did he do you know what rhabdo is rhabdomyolysis mm-hmm. I'm like convinced he probably had rhabdo when you're dehydrated and you overwork your muscles and your kidneys essentially just like shut down. Um, we haven't got toxicology back yet, so we'll see what that's like. But it was just like the most traumatic experience <laughs> and something we were looking so forward to as a, like a unit. Like it was just the most traumatic stressful experience of my life that only just kept getting worse and worse how about you greg what happened when that uh when you got the knock on that door at 11 o'clock uh i imagine you with your mindset you just had to yeah, feel the worst immediately yeah and that's exactly it as soon as the knock i mean because we knew that they were going to alert us regardless um you know good news or bad news so as soon as i heard it i immediately went like he's he's gone but you know trying to remain positive as positive as you could um but yeah i mean as soon as as soon as they said hey can we come in real quick and i was like oh shit you know sorry i don't know if i'm supposed to curse or not but um um yeah so it it was definitely not something that you want to hear not something that you want to be woken up to and it's you know everything that you see in a movie that happens when somebody passes away and, you know, they're alerting the family. And unfortunately, that's what happened. And he was, Greg was immediately super upset. Like, I was furious. Like, and I know there's different, like, stages of grief and emotions and stuff. But I was so mad that he had taken these steps and put our life in danger and, was willing because if if we were at the top and we gave him like another half hour and we were like all right let's go he would have been like okay and totally okay with him continuously falling and us carrying him to the bottom he would have been okay with it and we were just no one does that like that's not a normal situation like people don't carry people to the bottom of the grand canyon because it's not safe and it, it's just, I was just so mad that we were looking forward to this trip and he couldn't just stay there and wait because he knew a ranger was coming. He knew that the helicopter was probably going to come. Like, he knew all of this. And he was completely there, like, completely with it. The guy was talking to him on the phone. He was completely with it unless something changed within the hour. But, it, it, and the... The rangers were absolutely incredible. I guess they're trained to deal with family members in grief. They were incredible. They were some of the most amazing people I've ever 
dealt with in my life. Um, and then we had to go to the ranger station and give them like a step by step of what had happened. And you did uh, that right like then. Time- yes. Yeah, like they, they knocked on our doors at 11 o'clock or whatever, and we walked to the ranger station from our cabin. And thankfully, we have timestamps on, like, all the pictures that we were taking. So it was, like, perfect, like, step-by-step, step, like, here we were, timeline and everything. And, you know, it shows us getting down to the bottom at 345 and, you know, just gives them perspective of where we were throughout the entire time. Before we got also before we got to the tip off, it took us two and a half hours to go two miles, which is a very long time to be going downhill. A very very long time, um, and especially like under stress and without food and things like that. But when we had spoken to them, they gave us the whole rundown, and they had a satellite phone there, so I immediately called my dad. And I didn't even know how I was going to tell him that his brother passed away. I was, I like, I, I called him and he picked up and I couldn't believe he picked up because it was like 1130 and it was a weird number calling his cell phone and he picked up and I said, dad, I don't really know what happened, but uncle Scott passed away. And it was almost like he knew, like he was like, damn like no other words really it was uh, like an absolutely surreal experience they asked us what we wanted to do um because they said when this this type of thing happens people make really bad decisions they don't sleep they don't really eat they don't drink enough water and then they try to hike to the top and then they're saving multiple people you know and that's the other thing they said because I was starting to like have not panic attacks, but have a lot of anxiety about what if the tip off wasn't there? What if that structure wasn't, wasn't there and we all died? Like what would have happened then? But, you know, they assured us, you know, they were like, you guys did the best that you could. You got him to safety. You made the best decision for yourself. We knew he was there. Everyone knew he was there. He's going to make the decisions he wants to make. I just, I can't wrap my head around it. But they said that they were like, hiking back up is a really bad idea. Because I was ready to just like, grab all my stuff and start going. And they that was when they said, they were like, do you want to get a helicopter out? And Greg immediately said, yes. And I said, my uncle was really worried about the cost of the helicopter. And they said, oh, no, that's free. The National Park Service takes care of that. And we were both like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you have got to be kidding me. He was so worried about the cost of getting helicoptered out, and it's free. So, if I had to guess, if I had to guess that that was probably the driving factor in him leaving the tip-off was how much the helicopter was going to cost and hospital bills and all that stuff. So at, like, even when we left in the, at the top, he was like, you guys go ahead down. Don't wait for me. You know, I'll meet you at the bottom. And we were like, absolutely not. Why would we do that? Why would, you know, why, why would we not hike down together? If it takes a little bit longer, I don't care. We can stop. Like we're in the most beautiful place I've ever been. I have no problem stopping. I ended up having a problem stopping every 50 feet. Um, but you know, at that point we didn't know about it and he had so much confidence going into it that he was like, just go, I'll meet you at the bottom. Like, and I can't even imagine what that would have been like. Some poor hiker would have found him somewhere. That would have been terrible. But we ended up getting helicoptered out. We woke up in the morning cause they were like, you have to go to breakfast. You have to eat something take non-negotiable. You have to take care of yourself because what if, and they said this a lot, they were like, what if, because they, they give you a lot of scenarios because you're like super upset and they're like, what if you guys made a different decision and we were taking three bodies out instead of one? They said, because that's not far out of the realm of possibilities of taking three bodies out instead of one body out. 
And I was like, and hearing that, you're like, it's just, it's so, it, you always hear about these things on the news or in a movie or something like that. And it's like real life and it just doesn't feel like real life at all. Um, it feel it feels like you're in some kind of a movie that you shouldn't be in. Um, and like having it be so real that they were like, you, you understand you, you, um, you could have died if your husband wasn't capable of doing what he did, which most people are not, you guys probably could have died. And it's just, they said that they said to us that the reason that they put the tip off there, obviously, as Jess said earlier, they used to call it the graveyard, but they've also had like countless successful rescue missions. If like from the tip off, if the person that's there just listened and followed directions. And that was the hardest thing to like put your head around is that we would have saved him. We would have gotten him back to safety and, you know, fully functional again. And he just decided to make the wrong decision. But even he wasn't even supposed to leave there by then. Yeah. Like he was supposed to stay for like a couple hours because they were like, oh, well, maybe he felt good enough that he left. And I said, that's not a thing. I said, I promise you right now that there is no there. there there's no world here where he feels good enough to leave and make it to the bottom. I said, there's no way that that's even possible. And they were like, well, it happens all the time because they don't know who you are. They don't know what we just went through. You know what I mean? Like, and they're like, well, it happens all the time where they start to feel good enough and then they start hiking down and then they make it down. And I was like, not going to happen. I'm telling you right now, that's not even a possibility for this. And they were like, okay, you know, whatever. And, you know, I guess the severity of the situation maybe wasn't understood completely. Um, and I guess same for my uncle maybe, but when they called him at three thirty and he didn't answer cause he had already left was insane. Cause he shouldn't have left. He needed to stay there for minimum another few hours. Um, but we woke up the next morning and it was just like this super surreal experience. Cause when you go down to Phantom Ranch, everything is family style. So we're sitting next to these people that have no idea what just happened to us. And we're sitting next to these people and they're talking about their hike. They're talking about coming down. They're with their families. They're talking about how amazing it is. Also the night before we go to dinner and I was like, one of our people are still up at the tip off and they, the people, <laughs> the people at Phantom Ranch, they were like, we'll just hold his food. That happens all the time. <laughs> they were like some, they'll, they make it down. No problem. Like, and I was like, he's not coming. Like, I was like, he's not coming down. We're going to go see him in the morning. And they were like, well, that happens too sometimes, you know? And I was like, okay, so things are making me feel good. Not Greg, but we're sitting there in the morning and people are like, you know, they're all so happy because they just check something off their bucket list and they're with their families. There's this like whole family next to us with kids and you know, they're like, wow, that was so hard. Um, that, that was like, my body is so sore. That was like so amazing. Everything's so beautiful. You know, when they're joking around, cracking jokes and Greg's starting to get so upset. He's like, we got to go. Like, I think I had like one pancake and like a cup of coffee and Greg had some food and he was just like, we, we got to go. We can't do this. And so we get out, we start walking down to the ranger station and we, we talked to a woman named Lisa. She's the like district national park service ranger. Um, also one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. She was so nice and she said all the right things. Um, and we start walking to the helicopter and she's kind of like, just trying to get our mind off of it. She's just yeah. trying to tell us off. she's, she's just trying, she's doing the best she possibly can. And I'm talking to her cause she's been around to all these different parks and we're obsessed with national parks. So I'm talking to her about all this stuff and the mules are starting to head back up and we're on the, the right side of bright angel headed down to the Colorado river. And the mules are on the left side and the two cowboys on the mules start talking about what happened because they had already heard about it. 
and they're like, I don't even know how he got up there. I don't know how they got him down. And she's like trying to yell at them to shut up. And I'm like, listen, this is only the beginning. Yeah. Like people are going to talk. This is, this is only the beginning. Like it's only going to get worse from here, you know? So just let them talk about it. They're directly affected. They go through this every single day. I can't even imagine the stuff that they see. Um, but we get down and Matt, who was the ranger, I don't know how they got him down. There was a gurney with wheels. So I'm assuming that's what they used. And they had my uncle in the, uh, the building closer to the helipad. And, you know, they're, they're talking to us and they're like, whatever you guys need, just let us know you're going to be in this helicopter. And I know this is a very weird experience for you, but it's also going to be one of the most amazing experiences you've ever had. And I'm like, what else could happen? Like what, (laughs) what else, what could happen? So they give us this whole briefing. They put us in the jumpsuits with the whole helmet, uh, like gloves, the whole thing, the whole jumpsuit. They brief us on the helicopter it's right next to the Colorado River, and the Colorado River's, like, pumping. It's going so fast, which that alone, seeing that, is amazing. Um, but the helicopter brings you up, and it goes all the way down the river until you get to the, like, Bright Angel Trail south, uh, like, the Colorado. Canyon Village. Yeah. And it brings you up. And over the over the village and everything and Grand Canyon Village and it was like we're both hysterical crying. It's like the most beautiful thing ever. We had joked around before on the way and we were like, oh, we should take a helicopter ride out here, ha ha ha, like because there's like a billboard that's like helicopter Grand Canyon rides, and we like joked around about it and we're like, well, now he's really gonna get a helicopter ride out of here, like absolutely unreal. We get back, we land. I actually meet the guy, the search and rescue man, um, that talked to my uncle a lot and that I spoke to a lot. I, I meet him. They have a, uh, like a family support liaison. They drive us back to the hotel so I could see my dad. Then we have to drive back over to her office to start talking about, uh, end of life things. Um, we don't have any information on my uncle cause he, uh, he was, he had a lot of acquaintances, but he didn't have a ton of friends. So we didn't have a ton of information. And then, you know, the, the whole cremation situation, cause he has to go to Flagstaff and then from Flagstaff, he has to get moved. They have to do autopsies. They have to see if there was any foul play because apparently there's sometimes investigations for that down at the Canyon. Um, it's just, and there's, it's, it was the most, surreal experience and then we're at the canyon for like another couple days walking around and like we're walking around and people are having the most amazing time they've ever had in the most beautiful place that has ever been created and we just had the most traumatic experience of our life and no one knows and we're like it is just insane that you walk around this planet walking by people that could be going through one of the worst experiences of their life and you have no idea. Like the most surreal experience, uh, most traumatic. Like we, there were times, I mean, Greg's getting all teary eyed now thinking about it, but it's just, we would just start crying in the middle of a restaurant. We would start crying. We would be sitting there looking at the Canyon, just start crying. He saw a baby elk. He started crying. Like, there's just no, there was no rhyme or reason. And then you're thinking back, like, a million times, like, we just never should have started. The night before, when we saw him drinking four glasses of red wine at dinner, should have, it, it, I, I, but my dad kept telling me, he's like, what were you going to do? What, 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 what were you going to do? Say no? He was, like, going to go either way. It didn't matter what you said, I don't know. And my dad, I was so worried because I was like, people are going to blame me for this. People are going to blame me for this. And my dad was like, my dad knew my uncle the best. And he said, you guys did the best that you, you guys did too much. You guys did way too much. You 
he if without you guys he wouldn't have even got there like he wouldn't have got to safety he wouldn't have got down as far as he did my dad said i like and everybody else that knows us they're like i can't imagine what you guys went through to get him there and i also don't know and i ask myself that every day that if my husband was not capable and most people say that they said if you guys were not as fit as you are you would have died guaranteed Everybody would have died. It's just what have the last two. What have the last two weeks been like for you guys? Because this is still so so fresh. So, our friends. We had a whole trip planned out there. We were going to do the Mighty Five in Utah, and we ended up doing that still uh, because if we came home and mourned, or if we were out there and mourned, at least our brains were, you yes, know, we're distracted occupied. and occupied. Um, but I also didn't want to come home because I didn't want to be confronted with reality and Mm. have to process everything. Um, we had friends meet us out there the day that we were supposed to come up. She was out there. So we had a friend out there already, which was such a help. And then another, our two other friends came out the next day and still did, um, the mighty five in Utah. We got back last Sunday. We got back a week ago. Um, but it's been, it's been really hard, really, Mm -hmm. really hard and really horrible, honestly, just to, because we have to keep reliving it because everybody wants to know what happened. And even though we haven't told the story as, as much as people have asked, it's, and that's also another reason that this podcast helps because it's, letting everybody know what happened to us because everybody knew something very traumatic happened, but they didn't really know what happened. They were like, Oh, your uncle just like died on the trail in front of you. And I was like, no, that's not what happened. It's, it's way worse. Than, it's somehow way worse than that. Um, but it's, it's been, it's been really hard. It's been a lot of, we have a lot of nightmares. We have a lot of anxiety at, you know, when I'm not working, cause I kind of hit the ground running and just started, working immediately on Monday, but whenever I have time to think about it, it's like, I have a ton of anxiety about what if something, what if Greg died? What if I died? What if we had to live life without each other? You know, like what could I have done differently? What decisions could we have made that were different? Um, you know, what if we would have stayed at the shelter? What if we would have stayed all stayed overnight at the shelter? Would that have been okay? Who knows? Who knows? But it's like lots of therapy, <laughs> lots, lots of talking to our therapists and talking to each other, making, you know, the biggest thing is not to keep it inside and to keep talking to people. And we have the, we have a great support system. We have a lot of really, really close friends. Um, my dad's not a big talker, so I'm always worrying about him because he has to deal with a lot of the uh, not fun stuff that goes along with someone dying that doesn't have um, direct relatives. But Or a will. Or a will. So, yeah, that's so just... that, he's going through a mess right now, I'm sure. Yeah. And, you know, the whole thing, We the next day I went with my dad and Greg to spread my grandparents' ashes and my dad was like, this is really messed up, isn't it? And I said, yeah. He said, we came here to spread these ashes and we're going home with more. And I was like, I cannot believe that this happened. Like, and it was within the first mile. I should have, we all should have known. It was within the first, first mile. He wasn't even in shape to be going to Ooh Point and back, honestly. Like, and I don't know what, you know, the self-reflection it takes to make that decision that you can't do something. Cause I know the ego, his ego really got in the way and he didn't want, you know, he was embarrassed about not being able to make it to the bottom and, you know, people think, you know, servant, like making sure that people knew that he got there and that he trained for this. Cause people had messaged me. And they were like, your uncle was training for this. And I was like, that's weird because it sure doesn't seem like it. Uh, like the fact that he couldn't walk down a mile. 
you know, and it was just wildly underestimated. Why? I don't, I don't know. He said he trained for it, but I don't, I don't know. Well, listen, and I, I we, we owe you guys such a debt of gratitude for coming on and, and telling your story. And, I, and I'm speaking for the Grand Canyon uh, hiking community. And, and I'm just curious, and it's, it's so hard to, for you guys, obviously, to process something like this, that it was so recent, but you know, you, you decided to come on this, this show and, and tell your story. And again, we're so grateful for that. But I'm curious what what the big takeaway you would want uh, to be for aspiring Grand Canyon hikers, maybe the ones that don't have uh, experience in the Grand Canyon, that were in the position that you guys were. What, what, what do you want them uh, to take away from this? And Greg, start with you. Yeah, so, I, I mean, absolutely. If you are having any worries or doubts or concerns or you know not sure that you trained enough as long as you are completely ready for it then yes absolutely do it it's going to be a once in a lifetime experience going down to the canyon but if you have any doubt in your mind that you're not going to be able to do it please don't do it please do not put people you know your group in peril due to the fact that you may not have trained enough you know that's the biggest thing is you know we were being told by scott that he was ready that he was ready that's all he wanted to do he was so excited to get down to the bottom he knew what he was expecting and he just did not produce at that moment and you know it put us in a lot of danger and i don't want to see anybody go through what we went through because it was eight hours of panic, you know? So that's the biggest thing is just making sure that you're ready, making sure that you're prepared, making sure that you take care of your body as much as possible. You know, just be smart. Please be smart. Hike smart. It's all over the Grand Canyon. Hike smart. Be prepared. All over the place. And we were, and luckily we escaped, you know? And unfortunately he did not. How about you, Jessica? You're just shaking your head. Don't underestimate it. Even if you've done it before and you think that you're better than the Grand Canyon, don't underestimate it. Nature don't. is a beast. And yeah. please trust and respect nature as much as, it can, as much as you can. And I don't think people quite understand, and I know that you you live in Arizona, so you understand hydration. People don't understand what it's like to be hydrated. Um, they think, you know, 60 ounces of water a day is going to get them by. And I, I'm like, that's for a literal vegetable. They, it's, it's, people think they are invincible and that nothing like this can ever happen to them. And to be honest with you, I kind of never uh, in a million years imagined that we would have been in this kind of situation ever, ever, ever. And as much as I preach hydration and how to be properly prepared for things, it still happened. And I just, just never underestimate nature ever. Be prepared. Think about other people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, this is a the worst possible experience that you guys could have had. And as someone uh, in a community that loves the Grand Canyon uh, so much, it's it, it's so soon, obviously. But I hope that you two come back, and I hope that you guys take on rim to rim, and you see yeah. <laughs> what the majesty of the canyon really should be, because you guys are in great shape. You're obviously. Um, prime candidates come back and do a rim to rim or even more than that. So I hope that you guys, when this, that when this all settles down, that at some point you guys come back and enjoy the Canyon for what it really is. We're, uh, we're already making plans on coming back the same day Good. next year. Oh, great. Yeah. Good. As a Just little, like, throw a little memorial. memorial. Yeah. Same day next year. Cause and all like, we've been to, I think 12 national parks at this point. Yeah. And the Grand Canyon is by far the most amazing place I have ever been. It's incredible. It's something else, but yeah, it and obviously people are not making it out and 
it's so serious. It is so serious, especially this time of year. And if you're not, if you think that even think that it's not a good idea, it's not. Like uh, uh, us, just a, li- a little preface. Like we, you, you're not able to drive. We had a we had a friend drive us to like the where the trailhead is. You can't get to the trailhead in a car. You can only get there via shuttle. So we were walking from like that barrier to the trailhead, and I was starting to get nervous because like I didn't know what to expect either. And like we had been prepared, but I was definitely nervous. Like we're going, we're hiking down the Grand Canyon. Like nobody does that. One percent of people that visit the Grand Canyon every year do that. That is a very small number. So it's like it's it's definitely something that that puts thoughts into your head that you may not be used to. And if you are doubting you yourself as you're walking along that path, please just turn around. Yeah. Do yourself a favor. Please don't put anybody in danger. Don't put yourself in danger. Just please be smart. Yep. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, again, you know, we're honored that you that you wanted to come on and, and tell your story and it's a service to the to the Grand Canyon hiking community and and to hikers in general. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why we did this anyway, just to yeah. spread awareness and you know try to try to keep your head on straight. Well, we're grateful for you guys. Um, thank you so much, and please let us know if there's anything that that we can do. Uh, we got a whole community out there that's that aims to to help people have their best possible experience in the Grand Canyon. And like I said, I, I hope you guys come back and experience the way that experience it the way that you deserve to. Uh, but thank you so much for taking yeah, the time today. Yeah, absolutely. June twenty ninth, June twenty ninth next year. If anybody wants to come with us, yeah. we're looking forward to it. And then you're going to come on, and we're going to tell a happy story. On there the you go. On that episode. All right. That sounds absolutely. amazing. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks on. for having us. What a story! So many lessons to be learned. Again, our sincere thanks to Jessica and Greg for sharing. There's just nothing more to add this time, folks. That's a lot to process. So let's just leave it there this time, okay? And let's talk about it in the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show Facebook group. And of course, let's be very respectful in that conversation. My name is Brian Special. We'll see you next time on the Grand Canyon Hiker Dude Show presented by Bright Angel Outfitters.